A very warm afternoon to one and all present here. I heartily welcome you all to an extremely enriching and insightful session on the topic Law of Trails. For our students today, I would say the most compassionate, budding lawyers. This shall be an amazing opportunity to learn from our esteemed guest, Ms. Lita, Ms. Geeta Luthra. Ms. Geeta Luthra is a designated senior advocate. Ms. Luthra has been practicing in the Supreme Court of India, the Delhi High Court, and various other courts. She is the Vice President of the Indian Council of Arbitration, FICI, Member ICC, Indian Chapter Core Committee, Member Law Asia, and International Academy of Family Lawyers. She is also a member of the Women's White Collar Defense Association. She was awarded the prestigious Inclos Foundation Scholarship for Law at Cambridge, where she pursued an LLM and her MPhil in international law. She is currently working, or she is currently an additional advocate general for State of Haryana and senior counsel for the Union of in Indian Supreme Court. Ms. Luthra has argued several prestigious matters in human rights, criminal law, and matrimonial law. She has lectured at various universities and law schools, including George Washington, USA, and several other international forums at University of College, London, UK, the School of Oriental and African Studies, London, UK, amongst others. Ms. Luthra has landmark judgments in various fields and has successfully defended rights of several members of society, including women, children, and transgender. She's also being a lead counsel in landmark arbitration and land acquisition matters. We welcome you, ma'am, at Asian Law College. And now I would like to request you to please take the session forward and enlighten us with your knowledge and experience. Over to you, ma'am. Ma'am, you, uh, can you please enable your camera and unmute yourself? Yes, yes. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. So um, it's a great pleasure to be among you. I uh, have heard uh, the reputation of Asian Law College. And the more I hear, the more honored I feel to be here talking to all of you. So thank you for having me. And thank you for listening to me. Now, uh, the subject of today with regard to trials, since it's such a vast subject of uh, various aspects of criminal law, I thought that um, it would be interesting to talk about the Sushant Singh Rajput case and the Riya Chakravarti issue with regard to that case. Now, the facts as they appear to us are that um, Riya Chakravarti was a live-in girlfriend of Sushant Singh Rajput. He died in mysterious circumstances. It is not known whether it was a suicide, an accident, an abetment to suicide or a murder. There are various, they are all various provisions of the Indian Penal Code. When we look at criminal law, there are three major enactments that we look at, which is the Indian Penal Code, which deals with offenses of bodily hurt, as well as injury to property, person, estate, defamation, murder, etc. Then we have the Criminal Procedure Code, which sets down the procedure. And as students of law, we always say, what is this? It's a boring subject. It's not boring. It is what will probably, if you appear for the defense, it is what will get your client out of the news. And if you appear for the prosecution, it is what will nail the accused. So it's how 
you conduct the investigation, how good you do your job of putting things together, that will win you your trial. Then is the Indian Evidence Act. The Indian Evidence Act, though appearing to be an old archaic act, seems to have stood the test of time. We keep having new enactments every day and we keep discovering how poorly we have drafted them and how many loopholes there are in them. But this Indian Evidence Act has been foundational in standing the test of time. So these three are the major enactments with regard to criminal law. Then over the last few years, you would have seen various prosecutions, read various prosecutions by the Enforcement Directorate by under the PMLA, Prevention of Money Laundering Act, the NDPS, the um, Narcotic and Drug Substances Act, Prevention of Food Adulteration Act, and uh, the SFIO, the Serious Fraud Investigation Unit of the government. So there is a whole variety of economic, criminal, terrorists, and such activities that have now come to the forefront. And those, those aspects of criminal law have also become important. So coming back to the RIA case, and I'll keep coming back to the Sushant Singh Rajput RIA controversy case. So uh, he dies, what is the provision in law? And I would welcome if, if my students are able to be interactive, what is the provision in law? that could be invoked when someone dies unnaturally, either as an accident or as a abetment to suicide or suicide or murder, but dies unnaturally, not a natural death. What is the law that comes into place? Let's look at that. Section 174, and I don't want to exceed my time uh, of 15 minutes, which I've, you have been kind enough to give me. So 174 provides for an inquest. With the paucity of time, maybe I may not be able to read all of it. So, uh, but I will just refer to these sections. So in Ria's case also, 174, the police got into action and started doing an investigation, oh. an inquiry. Ma'am, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt in between. Actually, your face is half visible now. Can you just uh, move your system a little backwards? That will help. Just a little backwards so it will cover okay. you. No, no, it will fall. Now this is fine. Perfectly fine, ma'am. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm sorry to bother you. Over to you, ma'am. Okay. If I'm not clear, please tell me because the space yes. between this and uh, my speech and right. the camera may be a little far. So if I'm not, uh, uh, if I'm not um, loud enough or clear enough, let right. me know. Ma'am, you're completely audible and the voice is very clear. All right. Thank you so much. So, uh, so then the first part is 174 CRPC, which is, comes into play for an inquest. Now, what happened in this case, the question is, was there a delay in the inquest report? Should it have been faster? Was there a post-mortem? Was there an issue? of one post-mortem report and then a subsequent report? Should it have been made public? 
the question of media trial will also come in. Uh, so this case in point, you'll see many aspects of criminal law and criminal trials coming. And this is when the trial has yet to begin. So um, certain aspects, then we look at that um, the um, inquest was taking time. They had examined family members of Sushant's family. Initially, it appears they had said no foul play. It seems after some deliberation, the family was pained, aggrieved, and they have, after a long period, filed complaints in the jurisdiction of the Bihar courts. The question then is, can you invoke the jurisdiction of Bihar courts? Or is the jurisdictional police station, the police station in Mumbai where the death took place? Clearly the jurisdictional police station is that. Now, one of the aspects will be, was the inquest enough for saying that the Bombay police was seized of the matter or could an FIR be registered because every police station within India, whether jurisdictionally, jurisdiction police station or not, has a duty if a cognizable offense complaint is made to it to register an FIR. <coughs> you would have read Lalita Kumari's judgment where it says cognizable offense, FIR has to be registered. So it goes to Bihar. There were two options with the Bihar police. One was to say, sorry, the Bombay police is already seized of the matter. So we can't do register an FIR. Please go there. The other could have been that they register an FIR and it's what is called a zero FIR. When a cognizable offense is said to have been committed and the station house officer of a police station gets to know, he can do it as a zero FIR. What is his duty once he does a zero FIR? I think it is in T.T. Anthony's case. Uh, It is either T.T. Anthony or Abraham Ajit. But then they have to transfer it to the jurisdictional police station. They can't keep it. Here, was this done? No, it wasn't done. So um, did the Bihar police have a duty or a right to register an FIR? This is slightly gray area because although an inquest inquiry was happening in Bombay, but there was no FIR, FIR in Bihar. The ground on which it is done was father is 74 years old. I'm sure I'm saying that this is throwing all law to the winds because if you, you can't be registering on the ground that the father is 74 and therefore can't go to Bombay. He'd probably just been to Bombay and this can't be a ground because otherwise no one would do it where the cause of action arises. Everybody will say, I will stay at home. Murders happened in Timbuktu, but I'll register it in Delhi in India. So these things can't be done. And that becomes a question mark. I'll come to the issue of a transfer petition subsequently. Now, the Bihar police decides to go to investigate. Did they have a right? I think if it's a zero FIR to be transferred, they don't have a right. In any case, they go there. And the Bombay police also don't act with the courtesy that they owe another state police. Ultimately, we are one country all the police investigating authorities have to cooperate with each other. This is not done. Then the matter goes 
uh, in Bombay. And in the meantime, Ria files a transfer petition. She is feeling persecuted. And an ED inquiry is also initiated against her uh, with regard to money transfer and money. Um, now, my own view on these cases is that when there is a serious investigation, like a murder case or abetment to suicide or accident or that kind of serious investigation, all other investigating agencies could stay their hands. You would have uh, read very recently about allegations of abetment to suicide in other cases. And the question is, does a person, can a person be said to abet a suicide if they are not participative, not goading a person, not jisko kehte uksaya nahi hai tumne, you haven't really abetted the offense. You haven't instigated the offense. So the question here is, have you abetted or not abetted? The, the stance should be very clear. A person kill, takes his life in a college and says that I failed because of X person who did not help me with my homework. Can it be a ground of a to suicide? No. The fact is that one has to be having fortitude to bear the ups and downs of life. That's what life is about. And therefore, cases of this nature, where an employee, for example, takes his life, he's lost his job, for reasons when an inquiry has been done and he's lost his job, can that employee's family then say that his suicide was abetted because he lost his job and therefore his previous employer is responsible? So these are aspects with regard to criminal law. Now, in this particular case, what would have been the remedy for Sushant Singh's family? And that is again part of criminal trial, a section we use all the time, 156.3. So an FI is registered under 154 in terms of Lalita Kumari, but under 156.3, you can request the court with regard to investigation being done by the police. Now, if you give a complaint and the FI is not registered, there are two remedies. The courts in one, Kuldeep Singh has said the better remedy is to go under 156.3. You file a complaint, you file a 156.3 saying police may be asked to directly to report about their investigation. So that's the right remedy. Earlier, a magistrate couldn't interfere. But in Sakri Vasu, the Supreme Court said, no, the magistrate can guide, can interfere. This was called into question in a later date, but has again been approved in various judgments. The reason is that oh, although investigation is only the province of the police, inquiry is the province of the police, the fact is that over a period of time, sometimes it is seen that police is partisan or is not looking at the entire evidence that is available before it. And that is why over the years now, it has slowly in these judgments, it's saying the magistrate can interfere. 
So it's not just the magistrate asking for an afford, uh, report by the IO and then agreeing or disagreeing with it. So what happens in a criminal trial is that moment this criminal law is set in motion by filing a complaint, registering an FIR, investigation is done, and then a charge sheet is filed. It may be a closure report, in which case there is a right to file objections against it. It may be a closure report, but the magistrate has a right to disagree with it. So this is how the criminal law is set in motion. Now, as you would know, even in Ria's case, um, you have a right to go for anticipatory bail in order, and this is at the initial stage of a trial, even before trial begins, because once charge sheet is filed is when the charge trial begins then everybody has a right to scrutinize the documents. So enough of uh, what may be pedantic and boring. Let me go back to this case that she had a right to go for anticipatory bail if she apprehends arrest or any of the persons who were called for questioning apprehend arrest. As you know, in this case, some people got scared with the questioning, some went back to Bangalore or other places. But the truth of the matter is that uh, was there an apprehension of arrest and was there a reasonable basis of apprehension of arrest? Despite the medical reports, which seem to indicate that the death was perhaps an accident. Of course, the Bihar police then sent it to the CBI. Now CBI is a special agency which has to examine on cases which have a huge magnitude. It can't be on cases which don't have a large magnitude. You will remember in the Tucci case, Shahid Balwa versus Union of India, the court said the court will monitor the investigation. Bench of Justice Singhvi and Justice, um, um, Justice uh, Ashok Ganguly. Now, the question is, under what circumstance can the matter be transferred to CBI? You remember in Indra Mukherjee's case, it was transferred. So the fact is state has to say, let it be transferred to CBI, which is center controlled, although it is supposed to be an independent completely independent investigative agency. Now, because of the political dispensations, Mumbai becomes at crossroads to Bihar. Bihar and the center are the same political dispensation. Mumbai is a different political dispensation. So Ria on one ground says she wants CBI inquiry but when she moves a transfer from Bihar to Mumbai, she does not make this request. When asked in court, she says, I'm doubtful. Now the question is, what is happening is this doubt about the CBI is becoming so heavy that many states which have given their automatic consent for transfer to CBI, in case the need arises, are withdrawing it because it is becoming a political dispensation fight and not a right to a fair investigation fight. That's what we should be looking at, fair investigation. This brings me to the other point, scientific investigation. 
one of the most important tools in an investigation is that it should be scientific. Is the investigation in India scientific? No. You know the nearby rape case. In that case, for a change, the state police in Delhi did a scientific investigation. Now, a case like this, where there is an inquest report, where there is a post-mortem, where there are medical records, where the police can easily determine the location of a person who has killed, who has been murdered, and it there are ligature marks or no ligature marks, whether the person has died of the asphyxia or the person has died anti-mortem or the injuries are post-mortem or anti-mortem. These are all important points and your trial will depend upon your capability to cross-examine on these issues. In this case, there was a lot said in the media channels about what the positioning of the legs should have been, what was the length of Sush what was his height, Sushant's height, the fact that he had made a one second call or a one minute call to a friend who didn't answer at 1.30 or two at night and casting owners because of that. The fact that he had made a few seconds call to his family. No, there was one other person I seem to recall the, it was the family. Now, the, these are all questions of trial, of cross-examination. But what I wanted to emphasize was the more scientific the investigation, the more chances of conviction in case a person is guilty. So this is what the prosecution has to look for in a trial. And what the accused has to look in a trial is how he can show holes by examining experts, discussing with experts how the body should have been positioned, that it was a natural positioning if a person has committed suicide. Show the fact in this case that the allegation that he was internally not happy was seeing psychiatrists. Examine the psychiatrist, examine independent people, see the post-mortem report, see if there is anything wrong or fudging in it. So these are various aspects which were needed to be looked at. India has come a long way where we said there is a presumption of innocence. We said a man is presumed to be innocent unless proved to be guilty. We said that 99 guilty should be let off, but one innocent should not be punished. We said, we no longer say, the law has changed. It's turned on its head. Sometimes because it is saying that it's terrorist crime, money is used for money laundering, is used for hawala dealings, and therefore it turns the law on its head. And therefore you have the PMLA where grant of bail before Nikesh Tarachan Shah's judgment by Justice Nariman of the Supreme Court had become a far cry. It's a judgment of perhaps last year or just the end of year before last. I can share the citation if you like. And uh, along those lines are the other judgments 
coming from Justice Nariman and his bench that liberty of a person is very important. That no amount of enactment should take away the right of an accused for his liberty unless he is about to abscond, unless he is going to tamper with evidence. And these twin factors are the important grounds to decide on grant of bail. In Siddharam Metre and again in Dataram, there are judgments of the Supreme Court both which say that a person even accused of a life with a life imprisonment should normally not uh, should normally be granted bail unless these two twin conditions are not satisfied. The extra conditions are imposed, no bail under NDPS, no bail under Makoka, no bail um, under PMLA uh, for those accused of scheduled offenses, no bail under SFIO is taking away whatever our English criminal law jurisprudence has taught us. Now, um, I, uh, in Ria's case, she was accused of NDPS. She's fortunately on bail. Her brother is not yet on bail. And the question will arise that does our no law need to change for those who are innocent consumers in mild quantities of narcotic substances, which are not of a hard nature. The law will also need to look at, in view of the Supreme Court's judgment, whether this condition that no bail would be granted has to be taken care of. One important aspect with these new enactments slash economic offense enactments is this, that the statement made of an accused would be admissible in evidence. Now, otherwise anything, firstly, accused can't be, make any confessional statement. He cannot be allowed to incriminate himself under Article 20 of the Constitution of India. But these, these enactments have turned the law upside down. And with the guilty, even the innocent come under the rigor of the law and are pulled under without bail, languishing for years and years, despite the Supreme Court's judgment. The fact is, Supreme Court, while it says that most persons should have liberty, also says that in matters of bail and liberty, the last stop should normally be the High Court. So having given you this overview, I just wanted also, while I was talking of this, 161 and 164. 164 is a statement made to a magistrate, which is admissible. All statements made to the police under 161 are not admissible, but can be used in trial to confront the contradiction made in the statement. And, um, As I said, the fundamental rights are to take care of citizens of India, including with regard to criminal law. But the jurisprudence on it is slowly getting watered down with a view, even if the evidence is not as cogent as could be. So one of the questions that has arisen out of this is, should death penalty be abolished? That's a question which is a debate. Since the time may memorial, even before I started practice, and it is the 
question even now, and the debate even today is healthy. There is an issue, which is that should we go from the adversarial system of criminal law and the police being the investigative agency to a system which is the common law system of criminal law, where one magistrate supervises an inquiry investigation and the other magistrate then tries the case. There is a lot being said for this. There were recommendations by the Prakash Singh Committee about, um, I believe, in about 15 years or more ago. And these questions have been rising from time to time. Let us hope that more importantly than our conviction rate is the fact that we are sure that those we convict are guilty. Otherwise, it is better to let off a person if the evidence against them is bleak or mildly circumstantial without all the dots being tied up. Thank you, folks for listening to me. It was too vast a subject, and I don't think I have even been able to touch the tip of the iceberg. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, really, really, uh, you know, it was really insightful. And I think our students must have learned a lot from this. And that is why we've been getting a lot of questions now. They want you to answer them. Uh, okay. Shall we start with the Q and A, ma'am? Yes, sure. And the students want to know who is the third party witness and can he be examined directly? So third party witness is a witness who is um, not an accused. He is an independent witness. So clearly a third party witness, in fact, an independent witness. Uh, so there is oral evidence and there is documentary evidence in Evidence Act and in criminal law. Documentary evidence obviously has higher probative value, but in criminal trials, for example, most uh, witnesses would be um, oral evidence in many of criminal law. So for example, a cheating case, a forgery case, they will be principally governed by documentary evidence. But say a murder case, a lot would depend on an independent witness or a third party who has seen the crime being committed. So that's what a third party witness is. Um, how can we differentiate the question of law and question of fact? How can you distinguish a question of law and a question of fact? So you can't ask a witness a question of law, but you can ask him a question of fact. Now, let me look at the, uh, at an example of a question of um, law and a question of fact. Let me see if I can. So, would you say that Ram, who has removed 10 rupees from here without authority is a thief. Would be a question of law and fact mixed perhaps. And did you see Ram Ruby removing 10 rupees from here would be a question of fact. So 
there would be so factually is what is within your knowledge even as a non legal person question of law is a person which is a question of surmise and deduction which can be made and is not permitted to be put up in cross examination so to illustrate this did mr and mrs jones leave their 10 year old son home with their baby for 4 days and question of law will be does leaving a baby with a 10 year old child for 4 days fit the legal definition of neglect so similar is the aspect so well, thank you ma'am indeed uh, it was very clear and crisp i hope students understood this now uh, ma'am next question is what is the importance of conducting a preliminary inquiry so this is really a, a a civil law kind of in question actually it can go into two realms because in lalita kumari certain kind of criminal offenses the court has said like cheating because many cases where a and b contract that a has to give b 50 rupees would be a simple contract and there's a breach of contract and then there would be a case where a person with a dishonest intention right from the inception says mohit can you give me this 50 rupees and tomorrow i will return it with as 70 rupees and you know from the inception that you don't have 70 to return and you are not going to even think of returning anything so one would be a cheating and the first will be a breach of contract such cases the court says do a preliminary inquiry so there are offenses and offenses where the court says you can do a preliminary inquiry to determine whether indeed it is only a breach of contract or a criminality attached to it and an act of cheating that's under criminal law in civil law and in in uh, departmental inquiries of wide magnitude you may often conduct a preliminary inquiry to see whether there is sufficient basis to actually give a show cause notice or to conduct uh to uh, uh do a departmental proceeding so for example uh, there are five files classified missing from an office and i may do uh i may be the head of department and i'll do an inquiry to determine where those five files went and from whom they moved to whom and how long they were missing from the office and what is the record in the transfer register or the dispatch register according to them so my first inquiry is a preliminary inquiry but my once i come to the conclusion that out of the three people sonu monu and one other it is sonu who has done it then i start a departmental inquiry against sonu then it is no longer a preliminary inquiry and goes into a departmental inquiry so these are in civil and criminal law what is a preliminary inquiry thank you ma'am uh the next question is what is the value of the statement of a person who is on death bed so this is a vet question although the evidence act says that it has the highest probative value 
in my own experience, I have seen in cases, women giving a false dying declaration because they don't realize that they are dying. So they think they will survive and go back into their matrimonial home. So they will say, no, no, nothing happened. My sari got fired by mistake. But actually, she had set herself on fire because she wanted to end her life or she had been put on fire. But if she also doesn't realize she's going to die, the doctor knows she's going to die, but she may not realize. And even though the doctor is supposed to warn her before the dying declaration, that look, you are going to die. So whatever you say with the truth, very difficult for a doctor to tell the girl this. Right. So when she makes a statement, we come across cases where people have made seven dying declaration. So two dying declarations are to the parents that my in-laws did, did me in. Five, two may be to the doctor who may, she may say something else too. Two may be to the husband where she said, no, nothing happened. This was an accident. So the problem is, although the admissibility of dying declaration is of the highest probative value and is considered sacrosanct because they say a dying man is only between himself and God. So he will tell no lies. The fact is that in actual practice, people do remain vindictive or scared or apprehensive or whatever emotions till the end. So the value is of the utmost purity of evidence in law. Indeed. What is the difference between statements under section 161 and 164 of CRPC and which statement has been evidentiary value or which one has more value? So the evidentiary value is only of the statement under 164 CRPC. And for this reason, now in rape cases, it's almost mandatory that you make this statement to the magistrate under 164. More and more, you sometimes see people are not making genuine cases. So uh, the fact is 161 is made to the police. So statement made to a police officer is not admissible has only small evidentiary value of being able to be put in cross-examination <laughs> to a prosecution witness to show that the prosecution witness is contradicting himself. For example, if a prosecution witness says, I saw the murder, it happened in broad light, daylight, and the light was very clear in, when he comes into court, then you can confront him to show that in his 161, he had said it was getting dark. It was in a dark place. So I could take a glimmer of, a, of finding who is the person, but it was not so well lit. So then you can confront him. This is what you said. And this is what you are now saying, which is correct. Right. I, I think this is enough of an answer. I can go on on 161 for long and 162, which are statements and improvement and so on. But one or two judgments of the Supreme Court have now cast a little doubt on the 164 statements. Otherwise, their value is also a very high value. Right. Um, what is the evidentiary value of a hostile witness in a trial? 
So this is very interesting. So under the Indian law and under the English law, I think the positions are different. So if a person proves uncredit worthy, and there's a Latin phrase, something false us no more, false us something, basically saying that if you are lying about one thing, your entire evidentiary value goes to naught. And I think that's what the law should be. Right. But in India, the law is that we will glean out that aspect where he is not lying. But according to me, the person's uncreditworthy. Right. So the Indian law is different. Now there's nothing known as true, hostile, or hostile, but it means person who is being examined for the prosecution, he turns turtle, he says, I saw the murder. And then he says, did I say I saw the murder? I never said it. I said that I met Sushila who saw the murder. Yeah. So the fact is that he's turned hostile, then the prosecution will say, call now, sir, I want to cross examine my own witness because he's not telling the truth. Sure. Then there will be aspects which he has told, like this happened at 5 p.m. It happened at Yusuf Sarai. Then you will pick up the fact that it happened 5 p.m. Yusuf Sarai to identify place and time. But regarding this part, you can say that he is being dishonest or hostile. So this is what's a hostile witness. Thank you, ma'am. What is circumstantial evidence? How much importance does it have during a trial? So there are many convictions on the base of circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is a very poor kind of evidence. But take for example, this case, Ram and Sham go into a room. Ram comes out of that room and later Sham's dead body is seen there. So this is one aspect. Then someone else says, I was passing by that room and I heard screams of Sham saying, help me, help me. Then there will be other elements which say the parents of Ram and Sham saying Ram and Sham were having a long standing fight. And that day Ram came to our house and told Sham that there's something very urgent I need to sort out with you. Come with me for 10 minutes and then Sham didn't come back. So there is a string of circumstantial evidence and you have to see whether the chain gets broken or is not broken. For example, in this case, if Sham were to die by a bullet wound and Ram is examined immediately after and there is no gun on him or thrown in that room. Then clearly something has intervened. Some part of the story, there is a break. So circumstantial evidence in many cases are sufficient to convict as long as the chain is unbroken. It is clearly not of the same heavy probative value, which is oral evidence by a third party or by a natural witness who has seen the incident. 
Right. Um, let's mm -hmm. move to the next question. Speedy trial is an essential feature of a fair trial. A speedy trial is important not only to the victim, but also to the accused. Is it the only way through which miscarriage of justice can be prevented? So that's not the only way. You can have many reasons for miscarriage of justice. If I start, then your webinar won't end. But let me think of giving you the answer. There are two phrases. Justice delayed is justice denied. And there is an equally important phrase. Justice hurried is justice buried. So in a rape case where a person got life imprisonment recently in Rajasthan, matter went to Supreme Court and Supreme Court has granted stay. The question was that in seven days, you finished a rape trial, sent a man to the gallows or for a, not gallows, but for a life sentence. How much opportunity did you give him for giving evidence, for conducting his cross, for engaging a lawyer, for preparing his documents, for seeing that the state's documents are all available, for calling defense witnesses. So there is um, there are two sides to this coin. You have to see that justice needs, particularly in India, we have under trials in custody. I'm most against that. But unfortunately, so many people can run away. And because the conviction rate is low, the courts are loath to give bail. This can't be a reason. In fact, it's a good reason to give bail because ultimately if a person is acquitted, how do you pay him back for the ignominy he has suffered? So there are various aspects, but while a trial should be expedited, while there should be far more judges, while there should be far more investigators, while you need to have far more sensitive investigations, the fact is that you also need to ensure that trial is not unduly delayed. Many cases you will see of POXO, of rape, of other offenses, where these poor people cannot even afford to get lawyers. By the time they are able to muster a lawyer, that lawyer doesn't have the wherewithal to get another copy which the previous lawyer has lost. Many of them are illiterate. They don't even know how to defend themselves. So in India, we need a lot of empathy. We need a lot of people contributing 10, 20% of their time to legal aid to get justice. True. Indeed. Now, what is PW1 and PW2 in the trial? Well, this is, there's nothing really like that. You see, PWs are prosecution witnesses, DWs are defense witnesses. So, PW1, PW2 would essentially stand for the first two prosecution witnesses. There's nothing uh, sacrosanct with regard to this expression. It is prosecution witness, so it's called PW. Is defense witness is called DW. And there will be, there can be many, for example, in Nirbhe, there were 86, 87 prosecution witnesses. There were many defense witnesses. 
So it will depend on the nature of the case, the evidence collected, how many prosecution witness, normally the investigating officer in a trial is a crucial investigating witness, is a crucial, crucial prosecution witness. What is the significance and value of media trial? Is media trial a contempt of court? Hmm. It can't be a contempt. Well, if you make a statement which is derogatory of a court and which scandalizes the court, it's a criminal contempt of court. A media trial is an act of travesty of justice. If anything in today's day of social media and media is a travesty of justice, then it is a media trial where a person, you see the Arushitalwad case, you see many, many cases which I can cite. The media should, according to the 200th Law Commission report, the media should not report once a matter has charge sheet is filed and arguments on charge are being done. But I go further. Media should not do any reporting the moment a criminal case, except true authentic reporting without being over investigative. This is a very long question on which many webinars can be held. It is not a single question in a webinar, but um, um, you know, you have to guard that there is freedom of speech is not trampled. So there are many cases which get the light of the day only because the media is being vigilant. Say the Nitish Katara case, say many other cases. Say, I feel the Priya Darshni Mattu case also. I'm not sure. I'm just saying that there will be cases where media needs to be vigilant, but media trial when conducted in a vilification campaign of one or the other person is the worst manner in which justice can be derailed. Right. Ma'am, though I think our students have lots of questions to ask, but looking at the paucity of time, we'll just restrict to one last question. Uh, what is the object of framing issues in civil cases? What's the object? So you've asked uh, the most uninteresting question as the last question, mm -hmm. but, uh, but let me answer it because, uh, so what is the object of issues? The object of issues is to narrow the controversy where parties are not ad idem the aspects and those will be issues can be jurisdictional, can be court fees, can be valuation, can be merits, whether a person is possession of a property, he's not in possession, whether he's entitled to possession, he's not entitled to possession, whether he has a title, doesn't have a title, whether the court fees paid is of the right court's jurisdiction, whether the cause of action is barred by limitation. So just to narrow the controversy, so parties know what are the points on which they need to lead evidence. What are the points which are undisputed in which they don't need to lead evidence and narrow the argument and the issues. That's why issues are framed in a civil case and then you go under section 14 in case you want additional issues to be framed. The task is the onerous task of a judge 
Both parties give their draft issues to the judge, the plaintiff and the defendant. Then the judge frames issues, casts owners to prove on plaintiff or defendant. And that's the purpose of framing of issues. I'm sorry to end with the subject, which is important, but and enlightening maybe, but not extremely exciting. But when you actually practice, you'll find it exciting. When we talk of it in academic terms, it doesn't sound. We fight over each issue as if our lives depend upon it. But when I put it across like this, it may not sound very enlightening or exciting. Thank you, everyone. It did, ma'am. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence today. The way you've answered each and every question, the kind of illustrations you've given, I'm sure that our new students, the new batch and the existing batch, both have learned a lot from you today. It was indeed a very knowledgeable session, ma'am, and I'm sure our students would have learned million lessons from you. To acknowledge your presence and as a vote of thanks, we would like to present a memento to you on behalf of the Asian Education Group. Though we'll be sending it across to you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. I hope we have a continued association with you. Now. It would be my pleasure. Very nice. My secretary, I was telling her, I said, I don't know whether I can take in on because I'm having a lot of work these days. Mm -hmm. But she was so full of it that mm -hmm. before I knew I could say Jack Robinson, she had said yes to you. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here. Indeed, our pleasure as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.